speaking. Uh, you have accredited your righteousness to us, and we find our, our value, our worth, in uh, the sacrifice that you made on the cross, in your blood that you spilled for us, Lord. And we're just thankful for that. I pray that it would continue to change us. And right now, as we look into your word, let that change us as well. Um, help us to be more like you, just even in the course of this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you again for being here this morning. So glad to have you here. Thank you for those that are joining us online. We're so glad to have you here as well. Uh, we're going to have just kind of a great time this morning. We're looking at great stories of the Bible. And uh, like I said, I, I want to say the greatest story of the Bible, because then all of a sudden people will be saying, oh, this one's a greater story, or this one's a greater story. And uh, today is part two, and actually I'm going to kind of break it up in a couple of parts. And I originally entitled it uh, A Fishy Story, uh, but I'm going to call it uh, You Can Run But You Can't Hide Today. So we're going to take a look at uh, Jonah chapter one is where we're going to be here this morning. But uh, one of the things I remember as a little kid is, uh, you know, I wasn't the angel that most of you might think I was at the time. Um, but, you know, I was pretty much a good kid. But one of the things I was notorious for is uh, talking back. <laughs> and so I remember one time uh, my dad said, you're talking back to me. And I said, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. I go, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. You know, you get it now? Like talking back to him, I should have shut up. But I always remember that he said, stop talking back to me. So when my son did it, I said, don't do it. I've already been through this before. But, you know, as a child, you know, as a young teenager and as a teenager, I think there's just God has created us in a way where we have this tendency to be rebellious, right? We're rebellious with our parents, and you can't tell me you don't have a similar story uh, to me with your parents. Uh, but we have this rebellious, rebelliousness attitude. And I, now that I think back as a, as a parent and even as a grandparent, I think back, like, how do I really feel when my son or grandson tells me that? Uh, I really feel not too happy. <laughs> but think of it in your own life. Think of it if your boss asks you to do something. Think if your boss asked you to do something and you didn't do it. And the fact that you didn't do it shows this rebelliousness to his authority. How do you think this would make your boss feel? How if your son or daughter did the same thing I did to my dad and talked back to him? How would it make you feel? How about if a teacher, you know, maybe some teacher, an instructor, would give you some instructions to follow and then nobody in the class followed them as well? What would God think if you rebelled against him? What would God think if you rebelled against him? You're probably like, oh, the wrath of God would come down on me. Well, we're going to take a look at the story of Jonah and watch how Jonah is rebellious to God, and we're going to watch what happens. So Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Uh, you know, it just shows us that God is giving him direction. God is giving him something to do. He's given him a purpose. He's going to give him some task that he needs to do. And it says in verse 2, uh, uh, God said to him, the Lord said to him, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So he gives this task to Jonah. He says, Arise, go up. He, he really means, hey, come on, Jonah, we got to go. I, I need you to go. It, it's rushed, but not like, I need you to go now, but like, hey, we got to get going. And he tells them the city that he needs to go to, and it's a city called Nineveh. And if you just kind of read, you're like, oh, okay, what's wrong with Nineveh? Well, the city is great in two reasons. Number one, its size. Uh, at that time, they also had walls for protection. And its population was about 120,000 people. The problem is that those 120,000 people were not one of the nicest people you ever know. Uh, they were very ruthless people. In fact, uh, one commentator said this. They were accustomed to tearing off the lips and hands of, of their victims. Okay, doesn't sound like a city you want to go to. Another one says uh, they would flay victims alive and made great piles of their skulls. 
Again, maybe it's a city you don't want to visit. Um, there was, uh, I came from a city where people don't like to go to that city, and we were talking about with some of my coworkers, and like, it's because our city has kind of a reputation sometimes of always being a bad city, and, and it's not a bad city, it's actually a great city, but the fact is that every time you see it in the news, the news station will say, live from Santa Ana, you know, and it could be an Orange County courthouse trial, it has nothing to do with the city, and, and we get this kind of reputation. Uh, so Nineveh's had this reputation. And God is telling them, I want you to go there. But look at Jonah's response in verse 3. He says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. God said, go. Jonah said, no. <laughs> God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I'm going somewhere else. Nineveh was 500 miles to the east. Tarshish was 200. 2,000 miles to the west. Not, not only was he just trying to go to like another location, he was just trying to get as far away as he could. And it's kind of like us. Sometimes God asks us to do something, and it's right in front of us. And guess what we do? We turn around and go the other way. Happens all the time. Happens all the time when you start straying away from your faith. It always happens all the time. You stop going to church. It's usually the first thing that happens. People stop going to church. And then you ask them, why don't you come? Oh, I'll be back next week. Okay, hey, you said you were going to come back next week. Oh, I'll be back the following week. And the following week, and then so all of a sudden, you don't come to church. All of a sudden, you were praying all the time at night or praying all the time in the morning. Then you stop praying. Oh, I'll get back in my prayer routine. Go again. Another day goes by. Pretty soon you're not praying. What about reading your Bible, right? There, you guys know that I always tell people you have to read your Bible. You have to get your daily read with God. You got to make that a spiritual habit for your life. And once you stop reading your Bible, <laughs> there goes one day. Okay, I'll get back to it again another day and another day. But I found myself in the same way, just as you, falling, falling sometimes into those bad habits. The thing is to recognize when you are in those bad habits that it's time to make some changes in your life. But notice that Jonah is fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He's being disobedient because we all know we can't get away from the Lord. Right? We can all sin and maybe we don't tell each other, hey, I messed up last night or I did this or I said this and I shouldn't have and you know, I've been angry and, and all this other stuff. And maybe we, we don't confess it to one another, but all of a sudden people, God knows. You cannot flee from the presence of the Lord. It's impossible, and Jonah knows this. And so when we see the flee from the presence of the Lord, it's really Jonah's defiance on not doing what God had intended him to do. Most of the time, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we want comfortability instead of accountability. We don't like when people call us out, like, why aren't you going to church? Why aren't you, you know, giving to the church? Why aren't you being involved in ministry? Why aren't you doing those things. But let me tell you something, that when God has a purpose in your life, he doesn't make things easy for you. He makes things ready for you. He's preparing you for the things he has planned for you, for you in your life. Remember the Apostle Paul, and remember the time that he had that thorn on his side, and three times he asked God, get this thorn out of me. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 through 9, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Lord, get it out of my life. But verse 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, God has a purpose for that thorn in your side. And you're saying, well, that's the Apostle Paul. What about Jesus? Let's talk about Jesus, right? What did Jesus want? Mark chapter 14, verse 35 through 36, it says, And going a little farther, he fell on the ground, and Jesus prayed, if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. He didn't want to suffer. But look at what he says in verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. God's will to be done. God's will, obedience to what God wants to do. 
So God said, go, and Jonah said, no. What is God calling you to go to in your life? Look at what else Jonah did. It says he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. He booked his flight. He went on Travelocity and got it. He got the best deal. He paid the way. And he got on the ship. He's trying to run away from the Lord, which is impossible to do. But look at verse 4. It says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. I think there's something we got to see here is that God is pursuing Jonah. The storm isn't through natural events. The storm is through supernatural events. God is in control. And if God is pursuing you, you're his. If God is pursuing you, then you are his. He's going after you for a particular purpose in your life. If God is not pursuing you, then guess who's won? The enemy has won. If you've thrown up your hands, man, you've lost out on a lot. God has always been looking for you. You have to decide who do you belong to. Do you belong to God or do you belong to Satan? Who do you belong to? The Lord is pursuing Jonah. He's orchestrating these supernatural events to get Jonah to go on the mission that God had intended him to do. But it's also getting the attention of the ship's crew. Look at verse 5. It says, Then the mariners, not the Seattle mariners, by the way, then the mariners, the sailors, were afraid. And look at what they do. And each cried out to... His God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. The crew recognizes that something is different about this storm. Something that that they have not experienced before. And so they do what they know they can do. This must be a God problem. This must be some divine intervention. So they go to their God's And they're all praying to their different gods. And none of it's working. (laughs) And they go, well, that's not working, so let's throw off the cargo so we can get better control of the ship, so we can go back to land or get out of this storm. And they're doing everything possible to get out of the storm. But look at where Jonah is in the rest of verse 5. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. Jonah is knocked out. <laughs> There's this storm, if you've ever been on a boat, where even the water is choppy, the, the boats are going like this, depending on the size of the boat. But this is a, probably a big ship, a big vessel. But it's still moving back and forth. And look who's being rocked to sleep, <laughs> Jonah. Everybody else is panicking. Everybody else is crying out to their deity, to their God. And none of that is working. And Jonah is sound asleep. He has no idea that these events are going on around him. And folks, when you find yourself, you know, down asleep from God and not listening to God or not even wanting to hear these things, sometimes it's hard to sense where God is trying to nudge you, where God is trying to orchestrate you to come back to him. But Jonah is sound asleep. He's probably snoring. He's down in the belly of the ship, so to speak. He's not doing anything to help the situation. Everybody else is doing at least something, and Jonah is doing absolutely nothing. But then the captain has something to say about this. Look at this in verse uh, 6. So the captain came... And said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Jonah, wake up. Get up. Why are you sleeping? Cry out to your God and maybe something will happen. He's telling him. Tony Evans, uh, the pastor in uh, Texas, said this about this verse. He said, 
it's kind of like the sinner has to tell the pastor to pray. Because the captain is not a believer in God. And yet he's prodding Jonah, who should be praying, to pray. And just to make another observation about Jonah and about how disobedient he is, you notice he didn't tell God that he was going to run away. He just ran away. He didn't say, hey, God, I'm not listening to you. I'm, I'm leaving. He just ran away. He just did this. And that's why I said it's like people who don't come to church. They just, they just go away from church. They don't even have a discussion with God. They don't even have a discussion with God's people. They don't say anything. And Jonah is continuing to be disobedient. But the healthy, sea, the heathen sea captain, as one per person put it, is the one who's prompting the believer to pray. We sometimes sleep through what God is doing. We sometimes sleep through what God is doing. But now Jonah is awake. <laughs> and let's see what action Jonah is going to take. Look at verse 7. It says, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Let's go ahead and cast lots. Let's just find out what's the reason this is happening. Remember, they thought that something's happening. Something, you know, one of their deities is, is causing the problem. This is something unusual. But let's see who it is. It says, so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. And they started interrogating him. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? They started interrogating him. What's going on? Why is this causing this? Tell us about this. They're in panic mode. They're trying to seek answers. And so they questioned Jonah about what's going on. And Jonah, you've got to give him credit here, in verse 9 it says, And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Uh, we have to give a little credit here, because basically what Jonah's saying is, look, I'm a follower of God. I worship God. It's like when people say, well, are, are, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. And even though maybe you kind of subsided from maybe even wanting to express that to people, it's like saying, I'm a Christian. Jonah's saying, I'm a follower of God. And it's the God who made the heavens and who also made the sea, the situation we're in, and the dry land. Jonah is confessing his faith openly. He's confessing his faith openly. And look at the response of the sailors in verse 10. It says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He gave them a little background, probably told them, hey, God asked me to go somewhere and I decided I wasn't going to do it. And this is the reason. This is the purpose of this storm. He's openly confessed his faith and the sailors have kind of confirmed it's not our God's, it's Jonah's God. They're recognizing that Jonah's God is a little different. That he's the one and true God. And this caused them to be very fearful because Jonah was running away from the God he believed in. But then it says in verse 11, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. In other words, it's gotten worse. And the sailors were still struggling on what are we to do. And so Jonah said to him, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Uh, the sailors are saying, Time out, Jonah. You want us to throw you overboard? And if we throw you overboard, essentially, we're, we're killing you. And so I don't know if that's going to work, Jonah. I, I, I don't feel too good about it. So look at what they do. 
Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Sometimes we're struggling right in our faith. Sometimes we're flailing in our faith. And sometimes we do things the way we think is right. And we spend so much time trying to swim away from the Lord, trying to get away from the Lord, that it's all a waste of time, a waste of energy, when all you need to do is come back to Him. And again, these sailors are not believing in God. But I think they're getting a little close to believing in Him. Because look at the very next verse. Therefore, you should underline this in your Bible, they called out to the Lord. Interesting that they did not cry out to their gods. They cried out to Jonah's God. They're saying a prayer. When people come to Christ, they say a prayer to God. It may be five seconds, God, forgive me of my sins and get me in now. Done. And it's not just a cry of desperation. It's a cry of recognizing who the Lord, Yahweh, in this case, is. And so it says they cried out to the Lord. And look at their prayer. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay us not on innocent blood for this man's life. Uh, uh, lay us not innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. As it pleases you. Not my will, your will be done. We have to remember that God has been orchestrating these entire events. It started off with a storm that progressively got worse and worse and worse. God is in control of these events. Yesterday was 9-11, and it reminds us of the events that had taken place. And most of us can probably recall where we were during that time. I remember exactly where I was. I remember how I found out about it, and I remember watching on the news, and I remember seeing the, the building number one on fire, and they said, we think a plane went through it. And then all of a sudden, when I turned it on, was that another plane? You know, it happened so quick. And you're still trying to gather your head and your thoughts and trying to wrap around what the heck is going on. Those events become so real to us. And people in general, people all over started questioning themselves, man, what it, what's going on? Why did this happen? People were seeking answers. And I remember uh, the pastor at that time, he, we decided we were going to open up our church for anyone who wanted to come and just either you know, pray or, or maybe were grieved because I, I knew people just like you who had families in New York and they were concerned about them and, and stuff like that or maybe knew some uh, firefighters or police or all the first responders. You know, People knew people over there and it was impacting them even though we were on the West Coast. But it was an opportunity for our church to open up the doors and say, hey, community, if you want to come in and you want to just breathe, you just want to find out, or maybe you're sensing a purpose in your life, you can come to us. I don't know why 9-11 happened, but God is in control. And I had to believe that, and I still believe that to that day. God used that for some purpose. I don't know. But God is in control. Like I said, it's interesting that these men began to pray to the Lord, and we can't miss that, because there's going to be a big change with these men. Look at verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. Woo! Jonah. And look at what happened. And the sea ceased from its raging. Talk about confirmation. It happened just like Jonah said it would. And then look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, don't miss that, and made vows. Folks, these sailors went from sinners to saints. I, I, I really be it. Some people say, oh, we don't know. I, I don't know here. This is pretty strong in verse 16. 
Why would they offer sacrifice to a Lord they didn't know? Why would they make vows to a Lord that they didn't know? I think these people were saved. And it shows, it goes to show us that even in our rebellion, God can still do a work. Even in our rebelliousness towards God, God can still do a work. And then we say, what happened to Jonah? He's been running all this time. Verse 17 says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Folks, God does things to grab your attention. God does things to grab your attention. The word appointed can mean a purpose or prepared. The Lord got ready. And that's what I mean is you, you can run from God, but you can't hide. You can't hide from God. God does things to grab your attention. And when, grab, when uh, the Lord grabs your attention and you begin to recognize what God is doing in your life, what God wants to do in your life, imagine the things you could do. You could tell people about your faith. You could tell them that, you know what, I was once like you. I was lost, but now I'm found, and God has saved me, and God has changed me. When you recognize what God is doing in your life, you can begin to pray for people. I think now, more than often, people need prayer. People are so fearful nowadays. This whole COVID thing has just messed everybody up. But God is still in control. But if you recognize what God is doing, you can begin to pray for people. You can begin to engage yourself with God's Word. You begin to apply what Christ wants to do in your life. Maybe He wants to clean up your mouth. Anybody ever have a potty mouth? Oh, okay, yeah. Anybody still have a potty mouth? No, <laughs> just no confession here. Okay, a couple confessions. But look, we know God has, still has to work, right? I mean, I, have, I, I know I've said a cuss word a couple of times, not recently, but I know. And then I remember one time I'm like, oh. you know, I felt so guilty about saying that. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And God is willing and stands ready to forgive you. You need to discover what God is preparing to do in your life. Now. God's got a hold of Jonah. <laughs> Jonah can't get out anymore. And you want to know what happens? Come next Sunday. <laughs> but in the meantime, God has a purpose and a plan for you today. I was reading this story. It says, uh, August 30th, 2005, there was a Coast Guard lieutenant and he was ordered to fly his helicopter to New Orleans. This is during, probably during one of the hurricanes, uh, just like one that's recently passed. But, and to keep the machine flying around the clock for what would turn out to be a heroic mission. His crew, none of his crew were prepared for what they were about to see, but they were ahead of every news crew in the nation. The entire city of New Orleans was underwater. And while their helicopter passed, and when they did their missions, they saved about 89 people, Three dogs and two cats. But when Lieutenant McConnell did his fourth mission of that day, despite 12 different flights to New Orleans, he and his crew were able to save nobody else. They all refused to board the helicopter. They were warned that this was extremely dangerous, that waters were not going away soon. And sadly, many of those people perished because of their refusal to be rescued. Is that you? Are you refusing to be rescued by God? And God has been knocking on your door. God has been telling you. God has been pointing you in the direction to come to him. That's you this morning. You can make a decision this morning to accept Jesus Christ in your heart. God is ready and willing to rescue you today. And you say, well, what do I have to do? Simply just come to him. Invite him into your heart. Understand that Jesus died for you on the cross and he was buried and he rose again that third day for you. And if you believe in his death and burial and resurrection and you believe it in your heart, 
and you invite him into your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. And that means you begin to lead a new life. It means you turn your life from the old life you used to live to the new life you have in front of you. And that's walking with Jesus. He's going to give you his Holy Spirit. And you're going to begin a new life with him. It's a new beginning. It's a fresh start for you. I want to invite you, if you have to make that decision here this morning, let's go ahead and stand and uh, bow our heads in prayer. Lord, this morning, I just want to pray for the, those that are here this morning, Lord, those that are watching online. I pray, Father, that you would speak to them, Lord. I pray maybe you spoke to them earlier in the service, Lord, their need to come to you. Is there anybody here this morning uh, that needs Jesus Christ in your heart? Would you just raise your hand? And I just want to pray for you this morning. If you want to invite Christ in your heart, just raise your hand. Amen. Anybody online, if you want to accept Christ in your heart, there's a little button we're going to put on. You just click on that button. Just let us know of your decision here this morning. Anybody else here this morning? If you've raised your hand or click on your button, would you just say a prayer right now? Just cry out to God. So, Lord, I need you. Tell him, Lord, thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. And Lord, today I want to give my life to you. I've been running my life my own way. And today I want to run it your way. Lord, come into my life. Lord, I begin to turn my life around. I confess my sins, Lord, to you. Lord, just take my life away with you. Thank you for Jesus, Lord. Thank you that he now becomes my priority in my life. Lord, thank you for forgiving me this very day, loving me. And thank you, Father, that I'm no longer running away from you, but now I'm running towards you and I'm walking with you. I give my life to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.
This morning, uh, we're so glad you came this morning. God has brought you here this morning for a pur purpose, and I hope God has spoken to you through the service here this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and stand if you're able to and bow our heads as we sing our last song. Lord, thank you uh, for bringing us here together, and thank you for showing us who you are, Lord. Thank you, Father, for those that have put their faith in you this morning, Lord. Thank you, Father, that uh, indeed the angels rejoice over anyone who's being saved. And, so, Lord, we thank you. We ask for your blessing now as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.